Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'll bring up, please, Peter Hubert. Please welcome Irina. Thank you. This is a really interesting conference. I have had the opportunity to talk to a couple of you um, over drinks, and if you haven't had a chance to come by and tell me what you are seeing in the economy, all of our economic indicators come with a lag. You know, the new unemployment numbers for California come out on Friday, but that tells us what was happening in December. So, you know, I, I really find it valuable to hear what's happening on the ground from you guys. Let's try that, okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the national economy as context, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're seeing in the California economy. Um, I do the forecast for the state of California, which I then hand over to the revenue team. They forecast the revenues, which is very difficult because California relies very heavily on um, things that are very difficult to forecast, like capital gains. Um, and then the budget is done on the basis of that. So. I like to start with this chart because it gives you a little bit of context about where the sources of growth are. So this is the US. Um, the way to read this chart is to look at the black line, which is total growth, you can see the huge fall off in 2009, that was the crisis, um, where pretty much everything was falling except for um, net exports, um, and government was actually supporting growth at that time. More recently, so the little dotted vertical line, that's where our forecast starts. Um, going forward, we do expect growth to start picking up. Um, it's sort of a joke among forecasters that we always say next year growth is going to start, and we've been saying that for the last three years, but really we think the next year, or this year really, <laughs> growth is gonna start. Um, so we should get a couple of years of sort of consolidating, unemployment rate should start coming down even faster. Um, we should get to a more normal situation. That is what we are forecasting. Hopefully it's gonna happen. Um, so the blue line, um, the dark blue line is consumption. Traditionally, the U.S. economy is very based on consumption. Um, you know, you see the contrast with China, where most of their growth is based on investment. They invest an enormous percentage of their GDP. Um, they need to shift to be more to, you know, more of a consumption-based economy. The U.S. probably needs to shift away from being so much of a consumption-based economy. But right now, that really is supporting growth, and we expect it to continue to support growth. Um, investment, however, is still doing strongly after a number of years of really falling off. Turning to California, this is California's personal income. So unfortunately, none of the breakdowns in the economic data break down the amount of personal income that comes from capital gains. Um, that's sort of an economic concept that is difficult to capture in the statistics. But um, you can see that wages and salaries, that's the green part, that's makes up the major proportion of what California sees in, um, in income. And that really supports sort of the revenues for the budget. Um, the other interesting thing about this is that that light purple line, that supplements to wages and salaries. So this sounds like a boring concept, but this is actually really important. Supplements to wages and salaries, they just changed the definition of this. Um, over the last year. So the people who collect these statistics, that's the Bureau of Economic Analysis, they changed this to better capture the current impacts of benefits. So supplements to wages and salaries are supposed to capture if I am paid partially in terms of my paycheck and partially in terms of promises for the future, supplements to wages and salaries is supposed to capture that. So before, we were, we were capturing this a little bit imperfectly. Um, but if, for example, a lot of your compensation is in the form of promises about retiree health care, that should show up in supplements to wages and salaries. So if you look at sort of old statistics and then new statistics, it looks as though all of a sudden we all got a whole lot richer, which in effect we are richer because those promises are worth something. Pensions are probably going to be an ongoing issue for the state of California. So. I thought I would highlight that. California income growth. So this is sort of like the US growth decomposition. Um, again, you can see the growth rate in 2009 just went off a cliff. I'm sure you guys remember all of the budget fights that were related to that. 
Um, everything went down. The one thing that went up, that light blue line in 2009, that's transfer receipts. So transfer receipts are unemployment benefits. Unemployment. This is actual data, uh, monthly from 2005 to the latest observation that we have. So the latest observation that we have is December for the US and November for California. Um, you can see huge rise um, and then it's been coming down. Structurally, it seems as though California generally has a higher unemployment rate than the US as a whole. Um, so people talk about uh, high unemployment is always bad. Not necessarily. Um, high unemployment could be related to if you have a whole bunch of industries in the state that just turn over a lot. So you have people will take a job for a year and then it's very usual to sort of be out of work for a month and then find a new job. Your natural rate of unemployment is going to be a little bit higher, but that's not a bad thing. That just means that you're a more dynamic economy. Right now, however, the fact that the California unemployment rate is higher than the US unemployment rate, that probably reflects weakness. So in that sense, we're not so happy about it. Unemployment has been coming down. We do expect it to come down a little bit more in the new report that comes out um, on Friday. I will note one other thing. Um, in December, there was a big drop in US unemployment from 7% to 6.7%. Um, that is a very large drop, and there were very few jobs added. We think that the unemployment drop was related to a whole bunch of people dropping out of the labor force because they were discouraged. December was also the scheduled end of extended unemployment benefits. Um, I don't think Congress has yet to renew those. Um, clearly, there are people who have been out of work for a long time. Not good for the economy. Um, it seems that it gets harder and harder to find a job the longer you are out of a job. There seems to be some sort of stigma impact where someone looks at your resume and they say, oh, you've been out of work for six months, there must be something wrong with you that I haven't figured out yet. That's not true right now because the average time to find a job is just much longer because of the economy. Um, so California in, in September put in a new hiring credit where it's supposed to encourage um, business owners to look a little bit harder at long-term unemployed. So you can get a hiring credit for um, hiring someone who's been out of work for six months or more. So if any of you guys are thinking about hiring, you should take a look at the long-term unemployed because you could get a hiring credit. Okay, this is the labor force participation rate. And this is something that I was alluding to in terms of people dropping out. Right now, we are going through a huge demographic transition because um, lots of people are retiring. All the baby boomers, they're starting to transition out of the labor force. Um, you know what they say about lies, damn lies, and statistics. So the labor force participation rate is based on the population that is in work 16 year, years old, 16 years of age and older, which means that if you have a huge cohort of 80-year-olds, then your labor force participation rate is going to look terrible. But, you know, they're retired, so that's fine. Um, your labor force participation rate can also come down if people stay in school for longer. That's not necessarily a bad thing because it means that they're investing in, you know, better skills, they're going to be more educated, they're going to be more productive once they actually do join the labor force. Um, the labor force participation rate was probably also a little bit elevated before the crisis just because things were so hot that a lot of marginally attached people sort of got pulled into the labor force. Um, this is particularly hard because the population is bigger. So just to keep up with the rate of population growth, we should be above where we were. That's why the unemployment rate is still so high. I realize this is a difficult chart to read. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, the bottom one, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll point out a couple things that I think that you guys can see. The, the bottom gray part, um, that's government. Notice that this has been very flat. This probably should have been growing sort of in line with the population, but it's been super flat. That means that as a percentage of the workforce, government has been cutting back. Government also includes things like teachers. So it's not just you know overpaid bureaucrats like myself. These are people who actually do work to prepare the next generation for the future. One of my sisters is a teacher, 
And she often tells me whenever I get too uppity that um, she is contributing far more to the future of California than I am, and I completely agree. Um, and yet, somehow, I still get paid more than she does. The other interesting thing is the first yellow um, sort of segment, leisure, hospitality, and other services. That's sort of been growing a lot. Um, we're happy about that because jobs are always good and getting people to the workforce is good. Those tend not to be very well-paid jobs. Some of them, I'm sure, are very well-paid. I'm sure at Fess Parker, they pay all their people wonderfully. Um, but, you know, th these can be part-time jobs. They could be hourly jobs. They could be jobs without benefits. Um, so the fact that a lot of the job growth that we're seeing is in these jobs means that the effect on the rest of the economy is not going to be as big as if, for example, they were Google engineers who were then going to go out and hire a whole bunch of waiters and masseuses. One other thing, so the top two segments, um, that sort of teal one at the very top is construction and mining. Construction, even though you know everyone said, oh, the construction sector has a whole bunch of people in it, um, it's actually fairly small as a total proportion of California's workforce. Um, it did fall off quite a bit in the, you know, after the real estate bubble burst, um, and we do expect it to start coming back, but it was not as big as people expect. Um, the other thing is that manufacturing is not doing great. Everyone always thinks, so oh, we need to get more manufacturing in California. You know, even if we get manufacturing investment, a lot of that is going to be very capital intensive. It's probably not going to bring back the jobs that people expect it to bring back. So, you know, California as a state does need to think about educating people for what, where are the good jobs going to be. A lot of those jobs are going to, are going to be in healthcare, um, and we can talk about that if you guys want. Okay, these are average wages. So that top blue line, that's information services. Um, I'm always a little bit wary of doing straight line forecasting and I still, even though I put this into our forecast, I still kind of doubt that it's going to grow quite that fast. Again, that dotted vertical line is sort of where our forecast starts. Um, but it had grown enormously. Um, so we sort of think that it's not going to grow quite as fast, but that's a really high wage sector. Um, part of that is there isn't a supply of people who have those skills. Um, part of that is demand. You know, that's where the jobs are. Um, the black line, which is sort of hidden by some other lines, right in the middle, that's all non-farm sectors. That's sort of like the average wage. And notice that government is right on top of that. So I made a joke about overpaid bureaucrats. We're not actually overpaid compared with the average. Thank you. In terms of CPI, um, so the US and California tend to be really close in terms of our CPI. Um, our CPI, California CPI is sort of a weighted average of the LA area and the Bay Area. Um, we're forecasting very moderate inflation. Um, you know, the monetary supply has expanded enormously over the last couple of years. Um, the Federal Reserve has really been trying to support the economy through monetary policy, but that doesn't seem to be showing up in the inflation. It's just not being lent out by banks. Um, it sort of is not being intermediated into the economy. People are not borrowing. Um, we really do not see any inflationary pressures. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure how much the monetary supply would have to expand before inflation were to pick up, but we don't expect it to pick up in the next couple of years. This is what I like to call a killer chart. I love this chart. Okay, this starts in 2000. Goes up until the last observation, which I think is October. Um, the light blue segment is single family homes. This is residential construction permits in thousands of units, uh, which is seasonally adjusted. Um, so light blue is single family, dark blue is multifamily. In the run up to the crisis, vast majority of this stuff was single family. More recently, it's been about 50 50. Um, the reason I think this is such a striking chart is that multifamily, you know, it really did not fall off as much, and it's held up much better. Um, multifamily tends to be, you know, even if it is uh, owner-occupied, it tends to be cheaper. 
Um, it tends to require like lower down payments um, and it tends to be denser. So what this is saying to me is that where the demand really is, is in cities, which is where the jobs tend to be, um, and also that people can't afford the single family homes. Um, I'm a huge fan of sort of dense construction, so I think that it's a good thing in terms of transportation spending and air emissions qual quality um, that people want to live in denser neighborhoods. But it probably also reflects a little bit of weakness in terms of what people can invest in, in homes. Um, one other nice advantage, by the way, of having multifamily structures is that people who live in apartment buildings or in condos, their water usage is much lower than in single family homes, of course. Um, so if California continues to be in drought conditions, we probably want a lot more of the population in multifamily structures. Um, this is a similar chart, starts in 2000, goes to the latest. This is California median sales price of existing single family homes. Notice the run up and the drop. <laughs> There was sort of some stagnation there a little bit. It's gone up quite a lot. I was talking to some of you about how inventory remains really tight. Um, people sort of are not selling their homes. Um, it's still a little bit unclear to me whether or not the stock of foreclosures has, has worked its way entirely through the market. Um, statistics on that are really difficult to come by, so really we sort of rely on anecdotal advice. So any anecdotes that you want to give me, tell me. Um, we do expect house prices to moderate in the future. You can't have this rate of increase again unless you want to get another bubble, um, but they should be recovered. Okay, this is my final slide, and then I'll turn it over again. Um, this is business cycles. So business cycle, expansions and contractions are not defined at the state level. They are defined at the national level. It's done by the National Bureau of Economic Research, they are the official dating committee um, in terms of doing the dates of the when the recessions start. Um, the blue line is trillions of constant dollars, so adjusted for inflation. The red vertical bars are recessions, so you can sort of see that recessions happen every so often. Um, and this is one of the things that we actually mention in the budget. So the average expansion is just under five years. We are now four and a half years into the latest expansion. The longest expansion was about 10 years. So again, I'm not seeing any signs of inflation. We're not saying that you know we see any signs of a contraction that's about to start, but it would be really, really unusual not to have a recession over the next five years. If we're pretty sure that we're gonna see a recession over the next five years, or definitely over the next 10 years, we should be planning for that now. So, you know, the governor talked a little bit about this in his uh, press conference that put out the budget. He talks about this when he gives talks, um, State of the State, I think he put something in about that. Um, if you know that times are going to turn, it's time for a rainy day fund, which, I've, I should have said this earlier in the meetings so that maybe they could have changed the terminology, but it really should be a drought year fund because for California, we would want rain, but that's not gonna happen. Um, the other thing interesting about this chart is that notice how much better we, off we are. Everyone talks about the recession as being so terrible, and it was, I, I, and there's still people who are out of work and it's really terrible. But in terms of overall GDP, we have really gotten so much better over the last 40 years. The, sorry, this starts in 1972. I'm sure that none of you can read that. Um, so it goes from 1972 to 2013, I think the second quarter. Thanks very much. I'll take questions later. So I like that she put this slide up because many of you know every time I give a talk, I put this slide up. Um, and people keep telling me, don't ever put that slide up again. <laughs> so she put it up. Um, so I think it's great. Uh, Anyway, the idea is, yes, we're getting richer. You can see the recession. You can see various recessions. But if you squint just a little bit, you see nothing except growth. <laughs> so that's what we should be sort of after is economic growth over time. Um, and um, we have a level shift, which means that we've come down um, during this recession. We certainly have come down. But you can see the growth is 
you know, maybe not quite as much as it was here, but overall, uh, we're growing again at about the same rate. We've, we've grown since about 1850, um, which is roughly about 2% um, in real terms per capita. Uh, next we, um, is Kathy Janega Dykes. Hello, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, this is an audience that I normally don't speak to, and I think it's, it makes this, my comments a little bit more powerful because I think all of you certainly understand the importance of tourism to our local economy, I hope, but you may not understand the trickle-down effect and how it's specifically impacting each of your own businesses, um, too. And I think I'm also here because um, I was invited to speak about a study that we just did um, on the cruise industry to Santa Barbara. Um, I'm a recent board member, um, and I think probably people heard me talk a lot about uh, my disappointment that this group never talked about tourism before in the, in the past, so be careful what you wish for. Um, so I'm on the board, and now here I am speaking, right? Um, so I'm here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the cruise ship study, but I first want to talk a little bit about our organization, which is Visit Santa Barbara, because I need to give you some reference about what we do and what led to this study as well, too. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, the tourism um, study that we did just recently as well, too. So just quickly, the mission of our organization is to promote Santa Barbara as a destination for visitors and for film production. We actually have um, a film commissioner under our umbrella who also services and promotes Santa Barbara as a destination for the various um, productions that we do have here in Santa Barbara. Our structure, we have 14 um, staff members. I have a 21-member board of director. I have my chair and my vice chair actually in the audience. Um, we have 15 TBID members, I'll talk briefly about that um, as well too, marketing committee and group sales advisory committee. Um, our operating budget is only $4 million, um, which is relatively small considering how important the, the industry is to our destination. And our funding is derived from um, the city of Santa Barbara. We also get um, a very small amount from the county. I see Bob Geist there, so Bob. Um, and then um, a large um, amount of our funding is through a new assessment that was passed um, about two and a half years ago. It's Tourism Business Improvement District. This is an assessment that is paid by our visitors um, when they stay at our hotels. And this amount um, varies depending upon which type of property um, you're staying at as well, too. But this more or less doubled our operating budget and has allowed us to be able to reach further in terms of, you know, marketing um, to consumers and, and be able to develop new programs as well, too. We also have a membership program and cooperative advertising platforms that we present to our membership. But I think what's really important is to take a look at um, really what our overall goal is, and that's to increase overall demand for overnight visitation, and this is both group and leisure during key times of year, and then specifically the first and the fourth quarters, um, which will lead to increased revenues, employment, and taxes in Santa Barbara's South Coast. And um, our, our program is really done. It's very goal-driven. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about that. You can ask me for our marketing plan at another time. I think what's really important for you to understand, we're a marketing agency. So now, not only do we need to develop you know, strategies, we need to be able to measure the results of each of those programs um, as well, too. And this really includes all disciplines. So we have you know, staff that's devoted to social media, to film production, to group sales, to leisure marketing um, and to public relations as well too. This slide I think is important for a lot of you because it really does demonstrate you know the trickle-down effect of the tourism industry and you'll see beyond just your typical or what you think are typical hospitality partners that are benefiting but it really is transportation and agriculture and construction um, that that develops as well too. And I think that what sometimes people don't understand is that when we have a visitor here, often they may be a CEO of a company that may want to bring their business back here. They buy homes here um, as well. They bank here. Um, and certainly, you know, the same with our hospitality industry as well. So I'm going to talk real quickly about a study that was conducted last year. Um, and this is a year-long visitor profile study. 
and it was really designed to demonstrate you know, the economic impact of the visitor industry and also the profile of the visitor who's coming into this area. And it was done um, through uh, self-administered surveys. Um, so these surveys were distributed by our hospitality industry. And then we also had a, a team of of research, researchers who were actually talking with the visitors on the ground throughout the city of Santa Barbara and the South Coast as well. And I think what's really important is that, you know, here we have um, 6.1 million visitors that are coming to this area. I think that sometimes people are surprised by that number. Um, what's kind of surprising to me is a large amount of day visitors. And this is really a, a personal objective for our organization, is how do you convert that large number of day visitors to overnight visitors? Um, and, and certainly, you know, I mean, one, you know, a, you know goal of, of doing so is making sure that day visitor has such an amazing amount of time, or amazing time here, and is presented with so many different activities that they do need to return and come back as well uh, another time. Um, I, I know our previous speaker, speaker talked about jobs, so um, I will beg to differ a little bit about what she said about the type of jobs that are available for our hospitality industry. Here in Santa Barbara South Coast, it represents about 12,000. Um, yes, um, you know, some of it, uh, those jobs are minimum wage. I think what's really important is that th these are, they provide, you know, seasonal jobs. Um, often they're, they're certainly um, jobs that people have for the first time. They provide the skill set to be able to move up into managerial positions um, in the future and to be able to take a look at different hospitality industry segments that they also want to work at. Visitor spending here, um, when we take a look at the, the sales tax revenues, generates $45.8 million in tax revenues. Pretty significant, I think, for uh, Santa Barbara South Coast. The transient occupancy tax collections represent close to 60% alone. Sales tax is 28%, property tax is about 12.4%. Uh, and I thought it's also important to find out a little bit about why our visitors are coming, because I think some of you also, you know, are curious about what are they doing here. 54% um, are here for a, a vacation or a weekend getaway. 11% um, come for personal travel. 9.4% come for a special event. 3.4% come for weddings um, as well. And then another 11% come for business. So really, they come for a variety of different reasons, and which really, um, you know, kind of uh, supports the reason why our organization has staff that is marketing to all of the different audience groups as well, too. They spend about 2.4 nights in our Santa Barbara Hotel. What do they like to do? Well, they like to dine, 88%, I hope so. What else are they gonna do for 2.4 nights? Um, shopping is really big here. Shopping is one, one of the number one activities uh, why people travel to Santa Barbara and, and really um, within the industry as a whole, too. Um, they like to explore the area's bars and nightlife and attend special events, and those were also common. I find this particular stat really, um, you know, rewarding as well. People are satisfied when they come to Santa Barbara. Um, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but sometimes we t tend to focus on maybe what's you know, um, not so nice about Santa Barbara, but people here are very satisfied over 76% um, and another 21% were sat satisfied as well. About 85% of our visitors come within the U.S., 15% um, come from international. And in fact, um, the U.S., Canada, U.K., and Germany are the top international markets. And we do spend um, a lot of money and a lot of resources within Visit Santa Barbara marketing to that international visitor. I'm sure if you're um, you know, walking in the downtown area, particularly on a July weekend, and you know, you may realize that speaking English is actually you know, a minority. Most of the people are speaking um, different languages, um, German, Sw uh, Swedish, you know, French as well too. And these are the people that are shopping and they're spending a lot of time and generally staying a little bit longer. So that international market is really critical to our economy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that was just completed. So um, everyone is aware that we now see more cruise ships coming into this area. 
Um, this year, we are, we are going to have about close to 30 of those cruise ships as well, too. And I want to talk to you um, a little bit about the history of how we got to this point. And during the economic downturn, the city of Santa Barbara um, reached out to a number of us and, and you know, asked us to take a look at the cruise ship industry to see if there is a way to bring more cruise ships to come in and really help our retail industry um, during that time. So we partnered with the Chamber of Commerce, with the Downtown Association, and certainly the Waterfront Department. Our role is to promote um, and try to secure those cruise ships coming into the area. The Downtown Association and the Chamber run an incredibly well-run hospitality desk um, when each cruise ship arrives. Um, this has been an, an, a very successful partnership, um, and um, what's key about this is that these cruise ships come during two times a year. We have two cruise ship seasons. We have the spring uh, cruise ship season, um, and then we have the fall season. So none of these cruise ships are coming during the summer period when I, we know that we already have a lot of visitors in town. And the focus is really trying to bring these cruise ships in during um, midweek. And again, it's the time when we need the business the most. So it has been um, an incredible opportunity. And we have 18 coming in this spring. And actually, we had one last week. You may have noticed um, the cruise ship that came in last week. And we've got another one coming in at the end of the month. And then uh, we'll continue seeing more until May as well. The project overview, this was done by a third party, and essentially this included surveys, um, actually, you know, personally talking with the passengers as they were getting back on the ship. So they had already been through Santa Barbara, um, they have enjoyed our many activities, and now we're um, getting back on the tenders to take um, these, you know, to take the uh, tenders back to the ship as well, too. And this particular, so what we did was we asked the survey company, and this, the survey company's destination analyst, to provide us with an estimated economic impact for just the fall season only, because that's when they were conducting the research project. And you can see that the economic impact of just the fall season was $1.2 three, four million dollars. Um, so it's quite a bit. Visitor spending also generates tax revenues for the city of Santa Barbara, which are estimated $158,000. Again, the fall season only. And this gives you a breakdown of how the spending um, was, was, you know, kind of created. How did they, where did, was the money spent? The largest contributors are certainly um, restaurants and retailers. Um, other miscellaneous uh, spending to um, City of Santa Barbara added to its coffers through passenger police fees about another 130,000 and then $16,000 as well too. So the City of Santa Barbara actually collects a passenger fee for every passenger and crew member that comes on cruise ships um, into the Santa Barbara. And then we also saw an additional uh, $10,000 in sales uh, tax increases. So pretty significant um, um, amount of spending. Then we asked the research company, you know, that just provided us with the data for just the fall season. But if we were going to annualize this, take a look at the total number of passengers that are coming into um, Santa Barbara throughout the year, what would the economic impact of that um, be? And the total amount for that was $2.4 million as well, too. Again, pretty significant impact. What's important for us in, um, with Visit Santa Barbara is most passengers are, um, are uh, first-time visitors. And 41% of those uh, first-time visitors say they intend to return to Santa Barbara again in the next two years. So we have a captured audience. We have an audience who had never been here before. And they had such a great experience, they're returning to Santa Barbara again. And it, this is an amazing amount of, you know, an opportunity to be able to market to a, a, a cap captive audience at a very low cost for us. Um, and I think what's also even important is that um, if we were going to take a look at uh, this, if this entire 41% of these visitors um, 
returned as a typical overnight uh, tourist. Given actual behaviors shown by our visitors, and this was done by our previous research project, that our model suggests that this would generate another 11,000 incremental visitors who could generate another $6.2 million in economic impact and $313,000 in new taxes for Santa Barbara over the next three years. This is why we market to the cruise ships as well, too. Again, um, we took a look at some of the uh, travel party composition as well. Um, and uh, most do come from the US. We do get some from the international, too. Um, the point of origin was, again, 83% um, within the US, 17% from uh, international residents. We also wanted to take a look at the shore excursions because if any of you take, sh um, you know, uh, cruise, you know, you can certainly get off the cruise and be able to visit the destination on your own. But a lot of the of our passengers actually book shore excursions, and what um, we've been able to do is work with a lot of our tour operators, and many of these tour operators are very, very small operators, one and two person operators who would never be able to exist or thrive without industries like this. So we've been able to, to help them, you know, kind of stay in business and, and really help them, um, you know, kind of develop a, a really good strategy as well, too. We asked our survey, um, um, our passengers, what they were doing, certainly shopping, sightseeing were the top activities as well, too. And on an average, our cruise ship passengers spend about $100 on excursions, meals, and shopping during their Santa Barbara visit as well, too. And this $100 is covered by about a party of 2.3 um, people as well, too. Our, th these passengers' opinions on Santa Barbara were really um, critical, too. So 70% of respondents report that their opinion of Santa Barbara has improved um, or, or very much improved. And this means that even though they had not been to Santa Barbara before, they had a perception of our destination. And we were able to turn that perception around so that they may have thought there wasn't much to do or they thought Santa Barbara was this, but instead they came back with a very positive you know, experience and are telling their friends and family as well too. And again, these are the people that are going to be visiting Santa Barbara again in the future. So this gives you a snapshot of some of the research projects that we were able to um, conduct in, in recent, um, recent years. And again, um, you know, a snapshot of who's coming to the area and, um, and which businesses are benefiting. And, and I believe every one of you are benefiting from this industry as well, too. Thank you. So today I want to talk um, a little bit about an update. As, as you know, I mean, a lot of this data doesn't come in that rapidly. Uh, there's a couple things I want to do um, today. I want to talk a little bit about the economy. Um, as Arena was talking about, um, I would say the U.S. economy is improving. Um, I put mostly in parentheses just because uh, there's some people who don't think it's improving as fast as they'd like it to improve, um, and in some areas where they'd like it to improve. I'll talk a little bit about incomes, uh, the labor market housing. I'll drill down farther. We'll get into some California and Santa Barbara locality uh, uh, information. So this is a picture of um, real gross domestic product. You could think of this as incomes at, if you like. Output and income is the same. Um, I've mentioned this uh, several times. This is what's called the circular flow. So anything that's output is going to be uh, also income. What I've done is I've looked at recessions going back to 1973. The recessions are these uh, from the National Bureau of Economic Research. They wait about six months, and then they tell us uh, when we are, we're in a recession. And then after we're out of the recession, they wait about six months and tell us we're out. Um, I can tell you a lot about them. I know most of the people on the NBER, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, six or seven older guys sitting around having a beer and uh, saying, you know, hey, Bob, what do you think? Does that look pretty bad? Bob says, it actually is Bob, it's Bob Hall. Uh, uh, yeah, and Bob says, yeah, it looks pretty bad. Um, a whole bunch of things are worse than we thought. Let's call it a recession. <laughs> you laugh. 
It's actually true. They have no metric for thinking about whether we're in a recession or not. There's no statistic that tells them whether we're in a recession. They look at a bunch of things, and I can tell you that if you look at most people who think about recessions, they tell you what they were learned in high school or college or something that says, like, two quarters in a row of GDP decline means we're in a recession. It's false. That's, that's not how we go. It's, anyway, um, these are recessions, as, as, as known by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, it goes back to 19, uh, 1973, there were, so there was a recession 73, 81, 90, 2001, and our current cycle. What happens during a recession is, and I, I put it zero right at the peak before we fell into a recession. So zero means that we just start at the peak, and then we follow the economy along quarter by quarter. And what you can see about this recession and recovery compared to other ones is it was deeper, and, it, and the recovery took a very, very long time. What does this mean? It means that, you know, 16 quarters after the peak, we finally got back to where we were in December of 2007. So our economy fell and we were poorer for all that time until 16 quarters, four years, um, uh, since December 2007. And now you can see that it's not growing as fast, we're not coming back as fast as in other recessions. So this is what I meant by Many people believe that, you know, things aren't going as good as they had hoped. They'd like us to be growing back up here much faster. Well, we're not, for lots of reasons, but um, I'll move ahead. This is non-residential fixed investment. This is investment in buildings and structures, non-residential. The reason I put this one up is non-residential and residential investment are very, very volatile. They get hit very hard in recessions. What does this say? It says that typically investment in buildings, in equipment and machinery, and now, by the way, um, things like patents and software design, um, falls by about 10% after about a year and a half, then it picks up. This last one, it fell by 20%. Much, much deeper. That means we're not investing in things like buildings, right? Firms are not willing to build new stuff. By the way, we just got back to where we were in December 2007 in terms of investment, right? So it took that many years, six years, for us to get back to the same level of investment as December of 2007. This is real private residential fixed investment. Many of us know that the housing market crashed like crazy. It stayed flat for a long time. It's growing, but we're not even close yet to where we are coming out of other recessions. We're not even close to back to where we were in December 2007 in terms of the amount of investment we're doing, okay? Um, but we're growing, right? We're growing. Now, this is why I say, and Irina pointed this out a little bit, and I, and I like that. Um, this is the employment to population ratio. This is how many people are employed out of the working population 16 and over. You can see what typically happens. It falls, it comes back. This is 2001, that was called the jobless recovery. GDP increased, but jobs did not come back. This is the current one. You can see it's completely flat. And many, many people point to this saying, look, the jobs aren't coming back, so the, the, the economy is still doing terribly, right? Well, it may not come back. There's no sense that it should come back to 2007. Those were boom times. All of a sudden we have people retiring, et cetera. So this number um, is not so useful to us in lots of ways. It's, so this is one of these embarrassing facts about uh, uh, being an economist. I don't know what this number should be, the employment to population ratio. My view of the world is it should be zero. That is, we should be as rich as we are today and nobody has to work. <laughs> That's my ideal world, you know. Great that people aren't working if we're still making money. Anyway, that's my view. So more locally, unemployment rates are definitely falling. Um, I added a, a, a line to what Arena had. I, we have the United States um, uh, total in uh, this bluish color. Ca California is in red, and Santa Barbara is in green. So you can see that um, you can see the recession, 2008. Unemployment rates went up like crazy and they've been falling pretty much since, right? So you can see that, uh, Cal as Arena said, California is typically higher than the US. Uh, Santa Barbara uh, County is uh, typically lower. 
Now, what I want you to notice in this picture is how volatile Santa Barbara unemployment rates look compared to the US, um, uh, California, and the US. You can see that it's very volatile. This is exactly the, the data that, this is the data you can get from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Employment Development um, uh, Department. Uh, so what happens here? So what happens here is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, they seasonally adjust data. By the way, this is a horribly technical, not real bad technical, but I'm gonna talk about seasonal adjustment for a while. I'm gonna show you why it's important to think about seasonal adjustment, and we don't think enough about it. And it's very important for a place like Santa Barbara where we don't really actually have much seasonal adjustment that we can point to. So what we've done at the forecast project is we're now seasonally adjusting data that no one else has done. So here's the idea. You can see that these unemployment rates moving all over the place. So if you want to understand what the trend is in unemployment, so here, who knows? You see it go from, you know, very, uh, you know, 8% to 11% roughly, you know, just jumping all over the place. Yet these look very smooth. Why is that? It's because the EDD and the BLS do not seasonally adjust county level or city level data. They do it for the state level data and they do it for um, uh, the U.S. as a whole. I'm going to show you how much it matters in a second. Now, um, as I said, BLS, EDD, um, they are seasonally adjusted. Now, um, we've received not a lot of data like since May, but what I've done is try to get a better understanding of the data that we do have. And I hope this, you know, provides some, uh, some ways of thinking about what we're doing. So what we want to do is we want to take out a seasonal component. This comes directly from, this is a screenshot from um, the Employment Development Department um, of California. And as it says right here, data not seasonally adjusted. So what they did was they went back and even though that for the state and for the US as a whole, you have seasonal adjustment, because they don't do it for the county, they had to go use the seasonally unadjusted data for the US and California and then put it all seasonally unadjusted. Now you say, why you, who cares about this stupid stuff? <laughs> Here's why. So, so now we've seasonally adjusted Santa Barbara County. This was the old picture. You can see the volatility. This is the new picture. The new picture shows that, you know, Santa Barbara unemployment rates have been declining pretty steadily. It's not very jumpy. And in fact, lately, you know, it's, it's lower than um, what we would have seen had we looked at the non-seasonally adjusted data compared to California and the US. Now, this shows you, if you take that seasonally adjusted data, and now what I do is say, okay, let's go back to January 2013, and that's whatever the unemployment rate was at that time, and then let's see the drop in it. Well, you can see the United States has dropped by 1% over the year. California dropped very, very sharply until May, then flattened out. And Santa Barbara dropped pretty sharply, kind of has slowed down in terms of the rate of change of unemployment. So it's been falling, but it's kind of flattened out a little bit. Now, what is this seasonal adjustment thing? And why should you care? So, what we're doing is we're taking this thing, it's a state-of-the-art procedure, it's called X13. I love things that are called X13. Um, X13, in case you want the technical details, it's what's called an ARIMA process. You all know what ARIMA means. <laughs> Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. <laughs> anyway, it's this horribly messy statistical routine that's used by the census, it's used by the BLS. It's used by almost anyone who removes seasonal uh, components uh, from the data. Why is it done? Let's think about December for a second. So what happens in December is people give presents to people. What that means is that people have to hire people in stores. So every December, what we see is there's an increase in employment. Every December, we see this huge spike up in employment in the US, in California, in Santa Barbara. Now, what you want to know is, 
if you looked at that without knowing anything about this thing that happens in December, if you didn't know anything about that, you were like an alien, and you said, oh my God, December's like the best month ever. Look, employment just went up by 22%. You would think we're in a boom. That's not right. Once you know that there's something in December, you can say, huh, usually it goes up by, you know, 2,200 workers. How much did it go up this time compared to the 2,200? Right? We want to know, are we better off this December than last December, for example? And that's what seasonal adjustment's going to do. Now, when's it important? It's important when there's a recurring pattern in the data. So, when are there recurring patterns? Well, I'll tell you one, December. I'll tell you another one. If you live in a place where there's lots of agriculture, there's huge employment when things get harvested, and then they lay a bunch of people off. They don't need them anymore. So what you see in very agricultural places are huge spikes in employment and huge declines in employment season by season. So it's that recurring pattern that you see. And by the way, there's lots of ways to think about how you want to interpret that data. So agriculture, big seasonal. Retail sales, a big seasonal. Housing sales, a big seasonal. Tourism, a big seasonal. Now, so here's an example. Let's look at farm sector uh, employment as a fraction of total employment in 2012. And let's look at all the counties in California that have more than 100,000 employees. Okay, so I'm just gonna look at these larger counties. Now, this is the, t the, the largest six counties in terms of agricultural employment in California. The largest, Monterey County. Right, so Salinas, Monterey County. Um, here's Santa Barbara. It's in the top six, it's in the top five in terms of the share of agriculture. Here are the bottom six, like zero. Right? San Francisco County, Alameda County, they have no agriculture, basically, in employment. Okay? So if what I was just telling you was accurate, that what happens in places where there's lots of agriculture, you should see more seasonals. You should see more seasonal employment patterns. Now, this is a picture, by the way. If you take the data from the EDD for Monterey County, you unadjust it, this is, the this is what the unemployment rate looks like. I mean, that's crazy. You can't see anything in this. Everything is the seasonal. Everything is, bam, you know, um, no one was hired. We hired a lot of people. Dro lay them off, hire them, right? It's because of the seasonal in agriculture. So what's gonna matter then if you're living in Monterey County, you wanna sort of understand what's happening in our economy, it's really hard to tell. Right? Super hard to tell. Now, let's use X13 and adjust it. This is the adjusted unemployment rate that, by the way, is, it looks like the national unemployment rate because anytime you see national numbers, they're seasonally adjusted. So my view is we should be seasonally adjusting all these things. So this is what now you can understand. You might not have picked out this very, very big trend, kind of seasonal component of unemployment that's been falling for, you know, 10 years in this area. And then you see sort of the recession, unemployment goes up. What this means is that compared to normal, that is, normally we lay off a lot of people when we, in January, when we don't, we're not harvesting anything. Um, compared to that, even with taking that out, unemployment rates really went up in Monterey County. So the data you want to look at, by the way, so today, if you went to the EDD and you said, what's the unemployment rate in Monterey County, you would get this number. You would get something like, you know, 9%. Actually, it's over 10% if you get rid of that seasonal component. So if you want to know how well you're doing in these local areas, you have to come to the Economic Forecast Project, <laughs> where we now seasonally adjust not only county-level data, but city-level data. So let's look at manufacturing for a second. Manufacturing is not very seasonal, it turns out. Secondly, almost every county has some manufacturing, unlike agriculture. What does that mean? So here are the top six counties in terms of manufacturing. Santa Clara County, this is manufacturing employment as a, a percentage of total employment. You can see in Santa Clara County, 
it's about 17, 18% of the employment is in manufacturing. Um, the difference between the top six and the bottom six you can see, it's not that big. I showed you it was zero for agriculture. So if this is kind of right, then what should happen is, when we look at Santa Clara County, because it's mostly manufacturing, it turns out, we should see hardly any seasonal. And therefore, seasonal adjustment shouldn't matter. This is a picture, which is much, this is the unadjusted. And you can see that, yes, there are little peaks and stuff like that, but nothing like that Monterey thing that we saw. And if we seasonally adjust, it doesn't matter that much. So now it's going to turn out that when you want to look at unemployment rates or employment rates or housing sales or whatever has a seasonal cycle in it, and again, seasonal could be monthly, it could be quarterly, whatever. You need to think about this seasonal adjustment. Now, Santa Barbara itself, fairly large share of agriculture. It's in the top five. Therefore, there's probably a large seasonal component in Santa Barbara County unemployment rates. It also has a very large leisure and hospitality sector, which is seasonal. So now we can run this program, take out the seasonal. This is what the unemployment rate looks like in Santa Barbara County, the blue unadjusted. If we adjust it, you can see much, much less. So does it matter for Santa Barbara County? The answer is at times it really does matter. The number you should care about is this red number. This red number says, look, it's true that, you know, with the seasonal, because of the season that we're in, you know, unemployment typically goes down by this much. It didn't this time. So we have to change the way we think about unemployment. Okay? And it matters many, many times, as you can see. Again, the data we get from the EDD, and I know this because every month I get a call from the Pacific Coast Business Times and the Independent and stuff to say, the numbers just came out. What do they mean? And I keep saying, well, you know, it was mostly agriculture. But now we can show them this is what you want to look at, seasonal adjustment. So this is farm employment in Santa Barbara County. This is employment now. Again, there's a huge seasonal. So what you do is you take that out. What's been happening? And by the way, if you look here at the blue stuff, you know, it's very hard to see a large trend. You can see it a little bit, but it's so volatile it's hard to pick out the real trend in employment growth. So by seasonally adjusting, you can see that total farm employment kind of stalled here. It's been increasing, 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 you know, ever since. And by the way, it wasn't hard hit at all during the recession. As you can now see, if you looked at the blue, you would never tell that. Okay, so the lesson here is we need to look at seasonal, seasonally adjusted data. This is retail trade, as I told you, it's very volatile in terms of a seasonality. These peaks, as you could, oh, it's hard to see these gray lines. These peaks are, um, you know, very repetitive. That's what I mean, they recur. You get rid of the seasonal, this is what retail trade employment has looked like. This is the recession 2008. It was very, very steady, the employment, for many years until the recession. Huge decline, and now we're starting to pick back up again. Last month, huge spike relative to what it normally should be doing because of the seasonal. What that says is that we know that in November, before Christmas, um, there's a big spike. This one was even larger than normal. So when the data for December comes out, we can really see how it's going to change that trend, how well we did over the holiday season. Now, this is leisure and hospitality. Again, you can see very volatile, very seasonal. Seasonal because most of it happens in the summer, where we start hiring more people in, in that industry. Take out the seasonal, we can see a, a big increase in employment. This is the recession, employment's been growing, but now we have a little downward trend where you wouldn't see it very much if you looked at the unadjusted data. Okay, so seasonality in Santa Barbara is incredibly important. Why? Agriculture for the county, leisure and hospitality, et cetera. I want to turn to housing now a little bit. Housing prices have been rising. This is a picture from Zillow. For any individual house, Zillow's not so good. I know lots of you probably go to Zillow once in a while and you look at your own house and you go, oh my god, my house is worth more than that. Uh, I know, I say it. I do it too. Um, but for zip codes as a whole, 
Zillow's actually not so bad. There's been many studies done on comparing Zillow to actual stuff when you look at more and more houses. Individual houses, not so good. But the point is that um, United States, so this goes back to um, uh, 98, I think. Um, so this is the maximum level in brackets. I put 100 where the maximum level was. And so what you can see, what happened is back in the late 90s, housing prices in the US were rising. They peaked. They peaked after that um, Santa Barbara in California. They fell by less than they did in California and Santa Barbara. Um, and um, lately have been picking up. They're going up. Uh, it's not clear whether they're going to get back to that, that, that very high level, if that was sustainable or not. Unadjusted home sales in the past 30 days, we can also get that from Zillow. So there's a large seasonal component in home sales. That's what it looks like. This is the unadjusted data from Zillow. Um, Zillow doesn't do this seasonal adjustment. So the blue is uh, US, the red is California. And you can see home sales, very volatile, very seasonal. Here's the unadjusted, I mean the adjusted, seasonally adjusted. You can see it's, it's still kind of crazy because housing sales are very volatile. Um, but you, it's a little bit better. You can see pictures now. You can get a sense of trends where you couldn't before. You can see California kind of stayed high in terms of home sales, huge spike up, um, as many uh, real estate agents have seen here in town, and now it's kind of just um, bouncing around. I put in Santa Barbara now. This is Santa Barbara. You can see, again, seasonally adjusted, still very spiky, but, you know, um, Again, you can see the, uh, um, the decline here. And lately, we see a decline in um, uh, home sales in the past 30 days. And it's kind of just been treading water here for a while. So that's where we are on, on, on the home sales. Now, so far, continue the long, slow climb out of the depths. There's still some puzzling signs, as I mentioned. The labor market's one of them. So that's the kind of data that, you know, that we can be looking through. That's, my, that's the end, by the way, of what I'm going to talk about. Um. Thank you all again for coming this evening. I, I, I do want to ask you to please mark your calendars for our annual event, which is Thursday, May 8th. We'll be sending out information about it. We hope to see you there.